it's like that one thing my dad kept trying to tell me as the twilight inched its way on up his body Welcome to Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions. I'm your host, Jason P. Woodbury. Bonus episode. We normally put episodes up every Wednesday, and we've already done so this week. A great chat with novelist and podcaster Hari Kunzru. But since this week feels so undefined, we're throwing the rules out. So we've got a bonus transmission this weekend, and my guest for it is John Darnielle. Since 1991, he's released music under the Mountain Goats banner, in addition to writing a couple of great books. He's got two albums out this year. First, a lo-fi boombox recorded tape that he put out early in the quarantine, songs for Pierre Chauvin, and now Getting Into Knives, which was recorded before the lockdown with the full Mountain Goats band and producer Matt Ross Sprang at Sam Phillips recording in Memphis, the same place that people like Booker T. Jones, Alex Chilton, The Cramps, 3-6 Mafia, Roy Orbison, and many more have also cut albums. His songs have hailed Satan and cast possums in theological light, and he's written about myths, tragic heroes, and people trying to unwreck themselves. Getting Into Knives is yet another winner from Darnielle, and I was very excited to speak with him about it. Hope you're hanging in there okay this week. It has not been an easy one, but let's get into it. Here's my talk with John Darnielle. I'll speak with you more a little bit on the other side. He's just trying to warn his brother. The session that me and Matt did for you guys, we really enjoyed that. And you guys have been putting in good work for a long time, so I'm still going to be talking to you. Man, yeah. Well, that your session is uh, is one of my all-time favorites, and I'm really glad that we got that. Uh, well, thanks. Was, so that's actually a great place to start talking. You you recorded uh, Bon Iver's, uh Blood Bank for that. Yes, sir. That session. <laughs> Was that, was, how long have you been into Bon Iver? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not, as you probably know, I mean, I listen to heavy metal and classical. So, yeah. so I like, I like Justin's stuff. I'm not a big uh, acolyte. You know, I don't, I don't know the catalog that deeply, but, um, but that was the song actually. So here's, here's my, my story through Bon Iver. Um, his booking agent was my booking agent when, when he made for Emma, right? And mm-hmm. uh, and actually, my booking agent pitched him to open a tour, and I was like, "Yeah, I don't know if I want to go out with another acoustic guitar guy because I usually try to to mix it up, you know." And my dude Adam was like, "Okay, cool, whatever." Um, and then the next thing I did, I think, was the Blood Bank EP, and that's when I called Adam. I went, "Okay, I get it. <laughs> this is really really good, you know." Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the thing is, like that, that, that really was. I, I, I did not understand really for Emma. I sort of have an allergy to, to, like one reason I'm the Mountain Goats is because a guy with an acoustic guitar under a name that sounds like a person's name. I sort of have this in indwelling allergy to, you know. And, sure. And, uh, but he's not that actually, you know. But, but I think I was, I was a little reluctant. I'm always reluctant to embrace acoustic bros, right? <laughs> like that's just yeah. Which is, which is very funny because I'm me, right? So, but, uh, you know, I, I literally am like, you know, <laughs> kind of at this point, the iconic acoustic bro, right? But, right, but, right. Uh, but I grew up in Southern California in the 70s. And like, you know, that scene in Animal House where the guy is playing, I gave my love a cherry and Belushi smashes the guitar, right? Yeah. Like, 
I'm I'm of the generation who just stood and applauded when Belushi did that. I said, yes, yes, smash his guitar. Right? So, uh, right. But yeah, but when I heard Blood Bank, like what Justin was up to and the depth of his project sort of began to cohere for me, right? That there's, that there's you know, that singer-songwriter stuff is really just the tip of the iceberg there. Yeah, yeah. And it's only gotten weirder and more experimental and, and yeah. kind of like a, you know, trickier to wrap your head around since. Uh, well, but that's, I, the thing I, about, that's the thing about Justin's work is he's very brave, um, I mean, really incredibly brave uh, from the way I look at it. I mean, I'm, I'm at the other end where like, I don't make any new moves unless I really feel like it's time, right? Like I, I'm always very curious when I've done something, I'm really curious to see what else there is in there, you know, to hang out, yeah. to stay where I yeah. am and see what else there is to find in there. That's sort of aesthetically who I am. Like, I think, we generally live in a world where people think a, a thing has been exhausted before it really has been exhausted. Like people get tired of stuff early. I don't. Right. You know, yeah, there's yeah. bands being thrash metal now that are still really good and super interesting and doing new things. And thrash is 30 years old. Right. Um, right. So, so, so my tendency is to measure twice and cut once, right. To like, not, you know, don't make any sudden moves. Right. Whereas Justin yeah. is restless as hell. Right? He's like very, Every record, he's going new places every time. Time to use the vocoder. Let's go all in on the vocoder, right? He's very intense yeah. that way, right? Whereas me, like, if you wanted me to use a vocoder, it would be a 10-year project. You would have to, like, <laughs> okay, so mention this possibility to John today, and you would send yeah. an emissary to do it so I could yell at him, right? And then you would do that with three or four other emissaries over five years, and then I would soften and go, okay, well, people keep saying this thing. Maybe I should listen <laughs> You know, it's 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 funny though. Getting into knives as much as um, as much as I, I I hear what you're saying in terms of like you you, you like to explore very fully uh, an idea, you know, with with the band. But but getting into knives, I wouldn't say that it's a, a giant uh, stylistic shift or anything like that. But it is an example of how uh, consistently over the course of the Mountain Goats discography, you have been willing to let it turn into something very different from what it was when it started. Um, well, yeah, and I have, over the past three albums, I would say, become much more open. Like, here's the thing. It's really hard to convey this. And I've tried in multiple interviews to explain what the deal is. But when, when no matter what you do, people are going to perceive the project as just your deal, one person, right? Your rep rises or falls based on the success of your current release, right? Um, then you become very protective of each release as it comes. You feel like if you fuck up, then you will, you know, you'll be excluded. You'll be countered out, right? And right. Uh, and so I've been very, very, very careful about that. As soon as I had an audience, I was like, well, I don't want those people to feel like they no longer get what they want from it. You know, it's like I feel sure. I feel protective of those people and and faithful to those people. It takes me a long time because I have trust issues to understand that those people actually are more open than I think they are. They're willing to follow you down a twist or two, even if they don't really feel it entirely, they'll hang, right? They'll, they'll still be around, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I've learned that more gradually over the past three or four albums that you can make a whole album that most of them don't feel right. The most of the hardcores go, yeah, okay. Well, I don't know. You know, the lyrics are cool, but it's not really my deal, but, but they still hang because they know the live show is good. Right. They, they know that it doesn't mean the band has like taken a turn down some road. They're not going to come back from, you know. And so then you become more open to trying different things. Right. Um, yeah. And that's what I've done. You know, like, like, like in, I, I'm, I'm less concerned that if I do something weird that like that, it sort of brands me as that guy forever. You know, the thing is, like, there are turns you can make that like, you know, like I don't rap. If I decided to rap on a record you know, that would be part of my picture forever, right? It's like, so, yeah, so, so yeah. So I, I still stand by my sense that like, you should be judicious before you make a change, but I'm a lot more open now than I used to be. With, I mean, obviously you guys have made studio records, a lot of them. Uh, and uh, we, we spoke about goths when that came out and we talked a little bit about how you've embraced uh 
and refined your approach in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, your singing voice has has changed. It hasn't changed. It, you've just you figured out new and uh, you know new and and subtle and effective ways to do things with your voice. You know, so there's been that 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 well, artistic I mean, I'm, I'm, growth. So the voice, I think it has changed somewhat. It's like I, I have better command of it, but I'm just a better singer now. I think that starts on "We Shall All Be Healed." Um, it is where I really started to learn how to sing. And I think that actually what's funny, you know, I, I used to be very dismissive of the idea that, that technology could, could, uh, could inform your, your craft and your practice. But when you have an engineer like Scott Salter, very carefully picking out microphones for you, right. And, and picking the ones yeah. that, that best suit your voice. And then you listen in playback and he encourages you to go, well, listen to what we're listening to here. You know, then you notice what your own voice's strengths are, right? And um, and and you become aware, right? And yeah. uh, and it was on "We Shall All Be Healed" that I became a better singer. That was the that was the, the that's when that happens. So you so so as I was I, I, what yeah I think what I was maybe trying to to build to was that is this the first time that you guys have gone to a very specific studio in order to make a record? Uh, no, not to say. No, okay, okay. So you've always known, you know. Uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is, when we're talking about Sam Phillips recording, obviously, you know that Memphis, it, you've got it's got this legendary yeah. sort of uh, patina in in the in the history of music, obviously. Yeah. Um, um, but but no, you you've all. It sounds like you've gone places specifically where you think this is the right place for this project. Is that is that sort of how you pick? Basically, so from the beginning of the four AD era, and it was Peter who. Uh, who when 4AD called and it was time to pick a studio, I didn't have any idea, you know, I, I was been recording at home forever. And, uh, and Peter said, well, you know, um, there's a place right up the street. He lived in Rochester. He still does. Um, called Tarbox Road, the Flaming Lips recorded their latest one there. And he loved the Flaming Lips at the time. So, so we go there. I was like, cool. Well, it doesn't make any difference to me because I don't know. You know, so. Sure. Sure. Uh, so I said, sure. Um, I don't think I really, um, really grasped at that time uh, the, you know, how much a difference a studio can make. But then the next time I sort of did, it was like Freud asked me, where do you want to go? And Blonde Redhead had made a record at uh, Bear Creek in Washington. And I loved this record. I mean, Blonde Red, I don't know if you know this record, Melody of Certain Damaged Lemons, but like yeah. that record was a big record for me. Right. And uh, and so so I was like, you know, my thinking at that time, was like, go to the place where somebody has made a record that you love. Right. Was my thinking at that time. And so we went there. And the next time we went to Prairie Sun and I, to, I can never remember how I heard of Prairie Sun. But uh, but I know that it had a room that Tom Waits had been his main room for a lot of the 80s, for the back half of the 80s. So I was like, well, that sounds cool to do. Um, and over the course of those three records, I began to understand that choosing where you record, if you're going someplace, if you're not staying at home, uh, makes a giant difference. It, 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 you know, and some of that difference is controllable. Some of it has to do with, um, you know, with, uh, with, with stuff that you, um, you know, that you can decide, you know, and, and some of it doesn't, um, some of it is like, uh, uh, you pick, you decide to go someplace. Here's an example. Uh, we did Life of the World to Come at three different studios, maybe four. One of them is in South Texas. And when you get there, you can't really leave the property. And you can, but it's it's half an hour or an hour to the next town, right? Sure. So so then you are you're decamped, right? That's you're you're living there, right? And uh yeah. and, and you can't and the property is giant. It's an old pecan orchard, right? It's called Sonic Ranch. Um and it's an old pecan orchard, and uh, and you and but you stay there for your time there. That's where you live. That's the only person you are, right? And uh, and that's one thing. Whereas if you record at Mission Sound in New York City, I think it's like it closed recently, but uh, but we did part of all Eternals deck there, and um, and Mission Sound, well, you're right in the middle of Brooklyn, right? And so you just you go to Hello Coffee in the morning, and you and you sort of if you want to go out at night, you can. Um, and uh and it's a different vibe uh that these are variables of studio stuff that that sort of don't often enter into people's idea of the studio but but they have something to do with it yeah yeah 
What was what was the vibe at Sam Phillips recording? What was it like? So here's the thing. I talk a lot about this vibe, but it's all vibe because I don't leave. Like I I prefer to work 12 hour days if I can. And I'm not going to go out afterwards. Like you hear stories about the Rolling Stones doing some girls in New York and they're at Studio 54 after hours and stuff. I do not go out. When I clock out for the day, I go back to wherever we're staying. I stay up an hour or two to decompress, but, uh, but I don't go anywhere. I'm not hanging. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so I, always, I just don't. I want to work. I wake up wanting to work. Um, but the vibe in the room is immense. It's a very amazing feeling. And it's got history. And that's one thing I believe strongly in is the histories of the rooms you record in. You know, like it's a mystical sort of vibe. And of course, that's kind of nonsense, right? It doesn't, you know, like there, there's no... There's no uh, a usable trace of the cramps in that room, right? Well, sure. <laughs> but at the same time, it's going to affect your behavior, right? So the tr- there's no, it's not like, you know, you can pick up the shard that the cramps left on the floor or anything like that, right? But, but, but if you loved the cramps when you were 16, like I did, the first, the first show that I drove into LA to see by myself, right? I was like, well, not with a friend, but like, I got my driver's license and a couple of weeks later, the cramps played at the palace in LA. I was like, I have a driver's license. I'm just going to go in. Right. And yeah. I decided that morning, right. Prior to that, before you're 16, you know, you plan going to see a show for weeks or months. You go, okay, well, here's a show coming up. My parents have to take me or somebody has to take me if plot the whole thing out. And it's a big moment in show going where you go, there's a show tonight. I think I'll go. Right. For, yeah. for me, the first show like that was the cramps. Right. Um, and I went to see them at the palace on the smell of female tour. And, uh, and, and I mean, they were <laughs> the cramps in, in their prime is like the greatest band of all time, like literally the greatest band of all time. And I saw them at that point. Um, and that's, that would have been 83, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Po- yeah. Possibly 84. Um, so only a few years removed from when they had cut, uh, maybe four or five years removed from when they cut at uh, at Sam Phillips, which they did very intentionally. They also are thinking very hard about wanting to go to Elvis's studio, right? <laughs> so like that yeah, for the yeah. cramps, that's a big deal, right? And uh, and and so there's that history in there. There's the fact that Elvis didn't use it. Like Elvis, I don't think any recordings of Elvis ever got released. He bought it to to be a place for him to make music. But by then he was into his, you know, I don't have to make records anymore phase. Right. Uh, which, you know, it happens and for immensely successful artists. And, and so he would hang out there late at night, right. The whole Memphis mafia would hang out there, but I don't know what all they tracked. I feel like they part, they tracked parts of Kentucky rain there, but not Elvis, yeah. right. Elvis was at his house. He, he, Shortly after they built this, I think Matt Ross Spang told us he then had a studio built at Graceland and then he didn't have to go anywhere. Right. So, but, but still there's that it, it's it. So, but that's part of it too. Right. It's like, it, it's got that feeling of like they had some money to spend. So they made something cool. Right. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's, you know, it's funny when you say that, you know, there's not like a usable trace of what the, the cramps did there, but, yeah. but, but to some degree, on a spiritual level, right, or yeah. even an imaginational level, I mean, uh, of course, there's not, you know, uh, there's not necessarily v- vibe is 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 always a two it's a two part kind of combination, right? right? It's yeah. what you br- it's what you bring to the room and what the room maybe that's right uh, has for you, you yeah. know, and so and, and and so I guess you know I, I, it does this doesn't sound like it's a great record. I love it. Um, it doesn't sound like you said, now this is the Mountain Goat's soul record. There no. are touches, obviously, you know, there's some R and B flourishes and some horns. And I mean, anytime you've got Charles Hodges yeah. playing organ, you know, that's going to be in there. But, um, but I do wonder, you know, going into the studio, did you have an idea what kind of Mountain Goat's record you were looking to make with, with this one? And, and, and if the studio, felt like an intentional part of that puzzle or, or, uh, or how that came together. So I try and go in without expectations as far as that goes. Uh, like the sorts of expectations I have are, are, are more, you know, more about the mood between the players. Right. And I, I, I made these for this record, 
I actually plotted it out a lot more intensely than I did that I usually usually be going just like here's some songs we'll play them we'll see what happens this one I made out individual uh you know in Google Docs I made a bunch of documents saying well here's what I hear for this I learned over the past five or six years that it's really useful and this is the sort of thing you resist if you're a you know a singer songwriter a tour kind of guy you know like you don't want to be comparing your own shit to other people right but in fact yeah. in fact it's really useful to the other musicians you're working with if you can say look this song i see as a kind of blue oyster cult song right yeah now, when you're a younger songwriter you don't say that because you're afraid you're afraid that people will go well yeah but blue oyster cult's way better than that <laughs> it's like you know <laughs> What? you sure haven't you, and they are they're great well they are <laughs> and, and you don't want to be told you've missed the mark or whatever but uh but once you get a little older then you have the freedom to go look look i know i'm not boc but this is that vibe right and i feel like i nailed it so the song i'm thinking of there's rat queen right rat queen is totally a fake boc song right like that's what it is it's like it yeah. has that whole the chord progression is very blue oyster cult um that it like it, it sounds simple but then if you break it down there's like a ton of crazy stuff going on um it sounds like a normal rock song, but the lyrics are weird, you know? Um, so, so that's the sort of expectations I go in with, but I don't, I, it would feel kind of embarrassing for me to go, Oh, we're recording in Texas. So this is the Ranchero. <laughs> you know, yeah. Album. Yeah. No, like, certainly. You know, certainly. It's like, it, it always, I'm usually very resistive to that. Like if we're in a place to then use something that is native to that place, feels kind of weird. You know, I mean, using Charles Hodges, well, he lives nearby. That's why he's there. You know, um, yeah, it's not trying to harness the Memphis sound. It's that he's there, you know, and Matt knows him. Matt Ross Spang has a very profound feeling for these guys who have been uh, making records for a long time. And he gets along with them in this way that's amazing to watch. You know, he just he really, you know, he's 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 a young guy, but Matt is but but he really uh relates to the older dudes in a very deep way you know you can feel that they 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 know that his ear is special you know that, that he really hears what they do and understands what they bring to the table you can see that in the, in the way he communicated with charles when charles was there and uh and so i mean that's what that's all about it's like it, it, it's it's less about place there than about than about person than about charles himself because that guy i mean that fucking guy you can't even imagine what it's like to have Charles Hodges on your session for a day. It's the greatest thing ever. Well, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it sounds it's it sounds great. Well, dude, um, he comes in and he plays you the Al Green songs. Like he sits down at the fucking Hammond <laughs> and plays "Love and Happiness" and uh, and "Take Me to the River." You know, like solo on the Hammond, and you can hear it's like, oh wow, that is fifty one percent of that track is you. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, that. Crazy. that yeah, absolutely. It is not ornamental. It's pretty, it's like no, bedrock. It's, it's on those definitional. Songs. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 wild. This record is called "Getting Into Knives," yes. which is uh, a fantastic title for uh, an album. Yes, and, uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, you know, and you know, <laughs> one of my favorite songs on on the record, actually, one of I think I think it's destined to be one of my favorite uh, Mountain Goat songs. Period is the, the Bell Swamp bell swamp connection yeah and, um, and you know people are really connecting with that i'm super stoked i don't talking about expectations i don't really go into album release thinking what people are going to like like i assume yeah. they're going to like the loud ones i know that from experience like the louder <laughs> i yell the louder sure. that a certain contingent within the fan base will be like that's the one i like <laughs> so yeah short yeah. of that though i really don't have any expectations and people are going absolutely ape for bell swamp which i'm stoked about i'm very fond of that song it before i get into my my question about it i think part of what it is to me is that um i've i've read the lyrics a lot and uh and i still don't know what they mean and mm. that is uh well, i mean I, I i get it i'm going to i'm going to compare it to like a david lynch thing where you set up a very cool interesting sort of uh the the skeleton of the story is there you know what i mean mm -hmm. but it's in, it's in the mystery where all of the the magic lives you know, you know and not knowing a, exactly there is another yeah. songwriter whose work i'm leaning on uh in in telling this story who's uh, there's a little lynch access there but but he's really got his own thing and he's he is a guy who's completely in my neighborhood like of the people you would think of when you think of what i do 
there's probably three to five other people you might think of, you know, from the indie rock scene of the 90s, right? Uh, so I challenge you to guess who it is. Oh, man. It's a dude. <laughs> it's a dude. That narrows it down. His, early, indie rock his, dude his the- <laughs> early stuff was on tapes. He's still around, okay. st- still making great records. Okay, so we're talking about Bill Callahan? Then? Bill fucking Callahan, my man. <laughs> to me, like yeah. I was talking to you about how like I'm no longer shy about like once I when I write the song, I'm not thinking this. But after I write it, I go, okay, well, whose work is that similar to? Like where sure. where where should we situate that? In, what what is that in conversation with? And to me, this song sort of builds a little on the kind of ground that Bill lays with the stories that he tells, and specifically on a song of his called The Well. Mm, yeah 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 right in the well now in the so a guy goes off into the woods by himself right yeah. in my song a guy goes off into the swamp by himself and different things happen right in the well nothing whatsoever happens right a guy shouts down a well um and it's pretty amazing right in mine there has to be a sort of ghosty element because i'm me you know but yeah yeah but it's similar it's it's it's, it's about the spaces you go to alone in nature uh, and and how they cause you to contemplate, you know, yourself, right? And that's what that's what's so interesting about it is that you know the first time I listened to it, you know, I don't, I actually don't read the lyrics along with my first listen. I I, yeah. I usually save that for the second or third, you know. Um, but I, I just found myself really emotionally hit by that one, and it just hit this like deep chord inside of me. Hearing you talk about it makes me feel like I understand a little bit more maybe some of the stuff that's happening under the surface of that one. Well, there's but, um, that, but there's also like the images, you know, I write kind of automatically. I let words come out before mm-hmm. I think about what they mean. So, I mean, I don't know anything about you or your relationship to your family, right? But but there's this lyric in that song. It's like that one thing my dad kept trying to tell me as the twilight inched his way on up his body. Get out. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, the yeah. song declines to explain that to you, Right. But if you are a person, then you had a dad, as Jane's Addiction would say, right? <laughs> you had a dad, right? So, uh, and you have, if you're a, a dude, you know, uh, men's relationship to their fathers tend to be complicated, right? No matter what. Um, and so, so those lines, which are fairly automatic coming out of me, but they're dense, right? They're, they're, they're dense. And they, they're, they, they will encourage you as a listener to relate your own experience with your father to that. And I don't care who you are, your experience with your father is complex, right? When, yeah. Once those feelings come up, if a songwriter sort of opens that door for you, that lets you go into a place that's really intense, right? And so for most people, right? Yeah. And that, I mean, yeah. it happens spontaneously. I'm not describing myself as a craftsman. Like, oh, now I shall make people feel things about their dads, right? It's not like that, but, <laughs> but, but it is it just that happens, I, yeah. But it is that I know enough that if I, if I choose to stick with that line, you know, that it will open a place where we can all go. Cause when I sing it, it's a weird feeling. You know, my father is dead. He died last year, you know, and, uh, and he didn't try to intimate any last knowledge to me, but at the same time, you know, like if your father is alive or dead, you know that someday he will die and probably before you. Right. And so, uh, so lines like that sort of, sort of are very, if you've been writing songs for a long time, you know, that once you deploy an image like that, it's going to be a very feverish sort of space for the listener. Right. And then the other yeah. thing about this song is the way that I wrote it, because I wrote that song very differently from the way I wrote my most songs, which is like I do chords and lyrics. And I write them at the same time, right? Then I track to a rhythm and I, I pick the beat and it becomes more complex. This one, I, I knew what tuning I wanted to work with, an open tuning on the guitar, right? And yeah. so I started strumming it and then I found the beat, but it wasn't something I could play and sing at the same time, right? So I had, I had bit. It came together by bits and pieces, and usually a lot of the stuff you hear in the finished version wasn't there in the demo. The decorative parts, the synth part, the keyboard, whatever. In this one, uh, one of the organ parts that's in there was on the original demo because it was being written. The music was sort of running ahead of the lyric. Right. Yeah. And I would then be fitting the lyric into the music. So the line like uh, was uh, toward the tail end of the age is almost finished. Right. The reason that line is what it is, is because metrically it fit the musical line I had written. I needed to fit some words into there. And those are the words that fit. Right. Um, yeah. Now, 
that's a totally that's backwards. Usually I I pick the music based on what will fit to the meter I'm writing, but I went the other way on this one. Being Catholic by nature, I like that. I like for a discipline to force a behavior on me, right? So um sure. So sure. yeah, I, I think that comes out in the song. The song is in a way about a sort of spiritual discipline. Well, you sing in it, you sing my curiosity will likely always get the best of me, mm-hmm. which uh Look, I'll, the the dad the dad line definitely uh, hits on an emotional level. That one also hits on an emotional level for me. And, <laughs> I'm stoked. And, like this song, like when I was writing it, it was like I was also having a weird emotional response to writing it. I was alone in the house, you know, and, and I was like, oh, this is a little weird little story. What's going on here, buddy? You know, it's like, and often when I write songs that have a story like this, I think, well, you could deal with this here, or you could deal with these feelings in therapy right? so, yeah yeah and, yeah but when you choose to do it in song you have this sort of obscurity where the story develops and i don't challenge it i don't sit there trying to go oh what am i really thinking about no i just follow the images you know and see yeah. where they go and so then so then when you listen to it you're having the same experience that i had writing it of starting to, to chase this image down and see where it leads I feel like, you know, obviously you have, over the course of your career, you've written a lot and you've not been afraid to employ thematic conceits and frameworks. Mm -hmm. You know, you've sort of, you've, you've, you've organized songs sort of uh, around topics, um, in the past. And, and, um, and so when I was thinking about getting into knives and I was thinking about your curiosity, uh, I guess what I'm curious about is what the process looks like for you when you get interested in a subject. Let's say you find yourself going down a rabbit hole. Let's say you read a book about uh, uh, the effects of Christianity on early, uh, 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 early Christianity's effects on pagans or whatever. That, I know? did in fact do this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. So, so you're reading, you know, a, a book maybe by, is it, is it, is it Pierre, is it Chauvin? Chauvin, or Chauvin? Yeah. Chauvin, Ch- yeah. Chauvin. Okay. Yeah. So you're reading a book, you know, at what point, you know, is, is, what point does John, John's reading a book about something that's interesting to him? At what point does that become something that becomes a part of your creative process or becomes something that you think, okay, now I think I know this is going to turn into something. Do you know that, you know, when you're reading something yeah. or, or does it stuff that lingers with you? How does it work? You know, I wonder, I'm, I have a notebook here and I wonder if this is, uh, if this is the one that I had with me uh, when, when I got the idea for Pierre Chauvin. No, it's not. Uh, but like, I remember we were recording, right? And when you're recording, the ideas fire, but I usually don't wind up writing new stuff when I'm recording. Uh, but the ideas were firing pretty hard. And I was reading, often I'll bring a book to the studio, but the days get so long, I don't wind up reading. But I was reading Pierre Chauvin as we recorded. And, uh, and I woke up one morning and I wake up early and the guys tend to wake up later. Um, so I'm in the house we're all staying at and, uh, and I'm reading Chauvin. And I got really inspired. I mean, the thing is, like, reading about antiquity has always inspired me from the earliest days of the mountain goats. So, I, like, I get a lot of ideas reading about, especially first century AD, second century AD, third century AD, right around there. That's the stuff that, like, when I read about it, something about it connects with me, you know. And uh, and I read about, uh, God, what was it? The, the, uh, God, I'm actually grab the book now. Um, uh I read about this raid on a pagan settlement that got sold out by somebody inside. And I was like, man, no, it got sold out, but they, then they knew they were going to be attacked. Right. Uh, so they were, they prepared themselves. And I was really inspired by this, you know, the idea, if you know, you're going to be assaulted and, and, and then you, you know, you gather your strength, you know, sure. so that you can meet them with an unexpected response. Right. And, uh, uh, even though, you know, that in the long term you're going to lose. Right. Um, and I wrote down the title, uh, Owl on Raid. Right. Uh, and that was it. Right. And then I wrote a little something and this is in the middle of a recording session, like, you know, next album pagans. Right. <laughs> That's what it said with the question mark. Right? Uh, and <laughs> That's now, really funny. Now, so here's the thing. There are notations like that in a fucking Baker's dozen of notebooks that say next album anime or whatever you know it's like there's nothing it's just sure. that. gundams you know whatever it's like 
th- there's a bunch of of blind alleys, right? Of of, of ideas that I had for the next album, right? That yeah. did that yeah. did that did not wind up being the next album. But as it turned out, when we got home, lockdown happened two days later, right? And and there I was reading this book, uh, wondering whether we were going to go out in the late spring at all, you know, and feeling very sure. inspired, refreshing back from the studio. You've been playing every day with your bros. You're firing. If you can keep working when you get home from tour or the studio, you'll be at your best. Right. So I started working. Yeah. Um, and that's what happened. It's like, that's what I was reading. Many of the old Mountain Goats releases are exactly like whatever I was into at the time just my take on that right and still the yeah. case to some extent uh but now i have a bit, kind of a longer view where i'll like write down a title that that occurs to me like getting to knives which had been in a notebook for the better part of a decade before i wrote the song uh you know I get, i'll get a title titles are very evocative and weighty for me and when i come back to it i'll go oh what's that it's a sicilian crest what's that even mean right right well that sounds, right. Kind, of, sounds kind of fascist let me, let me write that song you know um so that's a, that's what happens there do you feel like knives are more dignified than swords? I'm just curious. Uh, <laughs> or, or, <laughs> My friend, that's an A plus question. It's a very. <laughs> I, it's think, a, I, I live. Think, I live for hearing that. Yeah. I, I want all the questions to be that. It's like, do you like dogs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so do I feel knives are more dignified than swords? No, I actually say I would feel the opposite. Um, okay. Because a sword, look you can conceal a knife, right? So mm-hmm. I can come up on you with a knife and you, and to, and to you, I look like, like your friend, right? That's the, mm-hmm. that's, that's the advantage of the knife. You don't know I have it until I pull it out, right? With a yeah. sword, all my cards are on the table with a sword, right? If I come at you and I have a sword, you are under no illusions about whether I have a sword or no. <laughs> you know very right. well. This guy, it's there. even if it's in like a sheath on my back, you can see it, yeah. right? You know, okay, wow, yeah. it's John Darneal and he has a sword. Right? <laughs> so it's, it's, this sucks, right? Why does this guy got a sword? So, whereas with the knife, I mean, knives are easily concealed. You have a switchblade, you can have, there's a million places. So, so I think the dignity of the sword is that, that it advertises that you are a swordsman ahead of time. Whereas a knife, you can be a weasel with a knife, right? You could, you could pull out a knife at the last minute, right? You'd be losing in a fight and then reach for your knife, right? You can't do that with a sword. That's right. If you get stabbed in the back, you know, dollars to donuts, it's a knife that got you. That's not, right. You know, you're not getting stabbed in the back with a lot of swords. Or maybe some people. Are. Well, in fairness, I'm I personally am as likely to stab you in the back with a sword as a knife, but but I'm an outlier <laughs> there. So. You you uh, have not been uh, you're you're vocal about your your Christianity and and your and your attraction to the yeah. ideas uh, espoused, but um, you know it it didn't seem like you had to work too hard to sort of cast the, the Christians as the villains in that particular tape for, you know, songs for Pierre Chavon, uh, you know, uh, well, let me jump here. here. Let me, let me jump in. Cause I, uh, uh, because there's Christians, right. And there's Jesus people, right. Who are also Christians, but the Christians as a historical identity have gotten to up, gotten up to so much bullshit, this nonsense yeah. over the years that no proper Jesus person can defend them. You know, it's like the, the Christians, as soon as they got a little power, they just became monstrous, right? Christians have done a lot of good over the years too. It's like, you can't really paint them monolithically once you reckon everything in the balance, right? Of course. But but you can't make any excuses for the way that early Christianity just eradicated local traditions that weren't hurting anybody, that were no threat, if they were any threat to Jesus at all, then Jesus isn't God. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, you, you of can't, course. there's no reason to go into Croatia and tell the people practicing these sort of, you know, uh, uh, earth religions, or oh, you can't do that anymore. We'll kill you. You know, it's like, it's, it's terrible. And like, I don't, uh, my personal position is you can't be a real Christian and be down with what the early church did. Right. The very early church was different. The, the first 50 to hundred years after Jesus the very early church thought Jesus was coming back like next week, you know, right. and they were yeah. not at all concerned with building a gigantic hegemonic uh, structure that was going to uh, govern, you know, that was not their interest. They went to caves, right? They went hung out. Yeah. I'd actually been to some of these caves in Crete where like they just went to hang out and wait, Jesus is coming 
they meant he's coming back the way your friend is coming back from Bojangles, right? So he's like, just he'll be back soon, you know. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he's gonna, he, and he's bringing he's bringing food with him when he, he gets he back. Will, it's gonna he, be great. He will be here with two pieces and a biscuit any minute now. And so <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, that's I mean that's how the early church felt. But as soon as as soon as that it becomes clear that's not the case, the church begins to accrue power and to co-opt already extant power systems, which is what happens with the pagans. Um, that they that they take systems already in place and infiltrate themselves. The Christians do um, in those existing systems, and uh, and and yeah, like I'm not, you know, I am not sympathetic with with the the uh, hegemonic arm of the church, right? Uh, yeah. Even though I'm Catholic right. by nature, so again, like the Mother Church speaks to me, but you know, Jesus doesn't speak for the people in power. Jesus speaks for the people who don't have any power and the people who right. have learned that, that, that the right decision, if you get a chance to get power is to say no. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, obviously we live in a world where we see, uh, the, the, the bad fruits of, uh, a certain kind of faith bared out all over the, well, all over the I mean, I got, that's not faith at all. That's just lust for power. That's, I mean, I, I have no, compunction about about saying like those people don't worship jesus they worship the power they think they think jesus will give them you know yeah, um yeah and they may think that that's the same as worshiping jesus but it is not right it's yeah. like to worship jesus you have to be willing to uh to give up everything right genuinely willing right uh these people aren't willing to relinquish any political power at all right whereas mm-hmm. jesus says you have to be able to reject your father and your mother right yeah. like they, they talk a lot about family values but those are jesus's actual family values that he says outright you have to re- be able to reject your father and your mother to follow me right yeah. um and that's the thing like it's one of the you know yeah I, th- those people i just don't you know i'm sure they experienced their christianity as believing in jesus so i don't want to harsh on what you know i don't want to say they don't feel it i'm sure they feel it but by their fruits shall you know them is where the scripture runs, right? Right, right. Well, from one uh, kind of God talk to another, when you announced this tape, uh, I was hoping uh, you'd say Wesley Willis, right? Speaking well, of a, hey, Wesley, Wesley Willis a, is on here. <laughs> speaking of a different God, <laughs> yeah. Let's speak. Let's let's speak about prophets. What 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 lesson? What lesson did did Wesley Willis teach you? Uh, so, in terms so of that that line actually is about how Wesley about how a third of his songs were in the second person, right? That they say you says so you yeah. caused me to go on a hell bus ride. You called yeah. me. Like and he says this, and then he says like shatter my harmony music, shatter my harmony music, right? And uh, yeah, and the way he does that, where he's addressing these people who he has experienced, right? Like when he says, you caused me to go on a hell bus ride, Wesley took buses around Chicago. I lived in Chicago for a while. The bus, if you get around the bus, like that's a big part of your daily reality. It takes you 45 minutes to an hour to get anywhere. And so, so that's a big part of your daily reality, right? And, uh, and for Wesley, who couldn't control a lot of his behaviors, to be on the bus was to be open to the abuse and mistreatment of, you know, the horror of normal people, right? And, uh, and 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 his brain would go to a bad place when they started to be dicks to him, you know. Uh, and he would write these songs, right, where he would address these people who he he was never going to see again, you know. And uh, and he would really tell the truth about them, you know. He would he would he would speak yeah. to them as if they were going to hear it and have to deal with it, you know. So that's what that line is. Is that when it comes down to something like the kind of vapid or you know almost lustful idea of fame that you're talking about in that song that like you want to direct, you wanted to direct that in a manner similar that Wesley Willis might have at no, the no. Kind of person you're, you're imagining. No, no. The Wesley line is discreet from the rest of the song, right? Uh, the Wesley line is saying, you know, that, that Wesley Willis taught me that the way to talk to you is to address you in the second person is to, is to, okay. is, is to be talking directly to you right oh um, i see yeah, otherwise yeah, yeah. The, the song is like the song is kind of the most classical song of of the record like because people have been saying since the fifth century bc at the at the latest that to be famous is double-edged right you get money right um and you get to be well known and we have a sort of assumption that that's good right to be well known except yeah 
the wise people among us know to ask at least, why is that good? Why is it good to be well known? What, what's good about that? You know, as Emily Dickinson, the wisest of us all, like knows. Yeah. There's actually nothing good about it, and nothing. And uh, uh, Franz Kafka knew it too, you know. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and the thing is, like, the worst thing, and I say this as a guy who benefits from being well known. Right. And so there's a, there's a, there's a tension here, but, uh, but, but the worst thing that can happen to you as a human being, right. Not, not in terms of your, your material well being. materially to get famous is to win, especially under capitalism. Right. If I get famous, I get money, right. I get, I get reliable money, right. Well, that's what you want under capitalism is to have a consistent source of income, that that doesn't even require extra labor from you because the truly famous don't even have to work anymore, right? They just can bank on their name, right? Uh, yeah. But what does that do to you as a person? Well, it excludes you from common discourse, from common humanity, right? And common humanity, at the end of the day, is the only thing that's worth a shit. <laughs> it's like everything else, yeah, is kind of worthless, you know. Now it's not, but at the same time, that's a complicated thing to say. What do you mean worthless? Is it worthless to have a good roof over my head? No, it is not. Right? It's actually very good to be able to afford to feed my family. These things are very good things, right? So, so it's a complicated thing. Uh, you can you can come at it from two angles on the same day, right? But but I think generally speaking, we've seen over and over again that if a person gets famous, they get worse, right? You know, uh, we we know. We know that, you know, as people who are into indie rock, including Mountain Goats fans, we know we often feel like, oh, yeah, no, they were great before people knew who they were. And then what the fuck, you know, it's like, yeah, it happens, yeah. right. And we all do this. I do this with plenty of bands I listen to myself where I like the early shit. And then later you go, well, you become self-aware then, you know, now you know that people are listening and, and I'm not really hearing your true voice anymore or whatever, you know, these things happen to you as a listener. It, you can't fight it really. And, uh, and so, so yeah, it's like, there is a sense not the only sense, right? Like get famous is not like a, not like a statement of, of a pure ideology. It's more of more of a, an angle. Right. Yeah. Um, but there is a sense in which the worst thing that could absolute worst thing could happen to a person is to get famous. Right. And, but that sense is real, right? It's like, you know, like it's easy for me as a person whose name is somewhat known to say to anybody, well, you don't want to be famous, right? Because plenty sure, of people go, yes, sure. I fucking do. Yes, I fucking do. <laughs> you let me get famous, okay? And then I'll tell you whether it sucks or not, right? Because it doesn't yeah. suck. It does not suck to have a good job, right? It does not suck to have people listen to your music. So I don't want to be saying, oh, yeah, no, this song is about how it's bad to be famous. It's not that, right? But that fame has parts about it that are just terrible for you as a human that, that destroy or 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 dampen parts of you that you need to be the human you want to be, right? To be the kind of person we hope to grow into, right? Fame is not good for those parts, right? If you're if you're aiming for spiritual development, fame is not going to help you there, right? Fame will not help you at all in that angle, right? Um, every spiritual tradition attests to this, right? <laughs> and so that's kind of what it's about. It's like you know, if the, if you wanted if you had an enemy, right, and and you wanted to say, oh. What do I hope for you? What, what do I hope happens to you? Well, I hope you get famous. I hope everybody knows who you are. <laughs> I, I, I hope you can't even go outside without people saying, hey, it's that guy, right? You know, it's like, that's, that's what I hope for my enemies. John, uh, I, I promised Mike that, uh, that, I that I would not keep you all night. Uh, and I'm a man of my word. So, uh, good so I'll, let, I'll let you go. But... Um, I, I do want to say that it's, uh, as always, it's a real tr uh, pleasure to talk with you. And, Thank uh, you. and, uh, and I could, uh, very easily ask you uh, a, a thousand more questions. And, uh, well, that, and that, but that that's would... only, but that's only because you only get to ask me two and then my answers are like 20 minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, I did, I did intentionally having spoke with you, uh, I think a couple, a couple times now I, I didn't write, uh, as many questions because i knew i knew <laughs> I, I knew that, that it, that's great. <laughs> i knew that i pared it down to just the ones i was most interested in so uh, this is very i feel seen i feel seen <laughs> in a beautiful way <laughs>
here at a truck stop in New Mexico. Just before dawn, somebody's grandma behind the wheel. Sean Darniel on this bonus episode of Transmissions. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, share it with a friend. Let them know they can listen wherever they get podcasts. And if you want to take your support a step further, leave us a review. Or even better, check out our Patreon page, where you can help us keep the lights on. I'm Jason P. Woodbury. I host and produce Transmissions. Andrew Horton edits our audio. Jonathan Mark Walls produces content for our social media pages and video outlets. Justin Gage is our head honcho and executive producer. Before I get out of here, Radio Free Aquarium Drunkard is going to be back on the air November 15th on DubLab from 4 to 8 p.m. Pacific. That's four hours of RFAD shows, including mine, Range and Basin, Tyler Wilcox's Doom and Gloom from the Tomb, and this week, a special presentation by the Jerry Garcia Camp in celebration of Garcia Live, Volume 15, featuring a tremendous trio set by Jerry Garcia, Merle Sanders, and drummer Bill Vitt. We'll be back this week, too, Wednesday, with another transmission. Until then, I guess uh, take it easy as best you can. Speak to you more soon. Out there at the counter Blending in with the lunchtime crowd Trying not to laugh out loud I eat half my crispy chicken club I get extra mayonnaise, it's a mess I take the other half back to the parking lot with me off the trunk and take a picture of my dress. I take a picture of my dress. It still looks good. I only wore it once.